Welcome back to another episode of Father Time with D'Amico and Blair, a podcast where dads talk about balancing fatherhood, relationships, careers, and passions. I'm D'Amico, your resident first-time dad navigating the wild waters of toddlerhood. And I'm Blair, the resident seven-year-old, uh, 17-year-old in the heart. She's a grown-ass woman. Kills. Today, I want to welcome in a very special guest, my man, Hack Dripulous, um, dad, drippy golfer, cinematographer. I mean, he has set the tone on how I dress on the golf course and off the golf course. My man, Ty Use. Thank you for joining us, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate both of you. I just want to say I'm proud of both of y'all, man. This is this is a dope thing y'all got going on. So I'm I'm proud of y'all boys. Oh, yeah. Same, bro. Uh, the transition from dropping shit, my fault. The transition from dropping Instagram reels to getting behind the camera and uh, creating Birdie uh, Birdie Vision Media Group is, is insane. So proud of you bro like no bs man i appreciate like the, that the, the flowers are, the flowers are abundant all around this motherfucker i appreciate that that's love <laughs> yeah man for real like honestly you and chris let me know what is like cool to wear on the golf course but not like in that grow the game type way like <laughs> like really what's what's uh what's the vibe so yeah man uh just the content you've been making I've been rocking with you for a minute. You've been rocking with me for a minute. So like, I'm super appreciative to have you uh, on the podcast in my life and call you a friend and a brother. The first episode, Blair and I kind of went over a uh, uh, fictional father's draft. Um, and we want to give you this time to give us your top five fictional fathers. Man, my top, first off, off the bat, number one is Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil is the greatest father of all time, hands down. That was my childhood growing up was Fresh Prince of Bel-Air every morning before school. So that was, uh, yeah, man, Uncle Phil was a big one. Number two, <laughs> number two, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods one, just being that, that we're in the golf space, but overall just anyone that sees their, their chemistry on the course sees – just kind of how he is even off the course with with charlie is is super dope and and i feel like that kind of gives me some inspiration to be a, a good father on the course when my son wants to play so all right so number two I'll, I'll put cleveland brown number two i think he would be a dope father to have low-key because them kids kind of be getting over on bro <laughs> so think- cleveland a pushover for real <laughs> I swear you'd be able to 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 get in trouble and and do some things and not have him uh, really know about it. But ooh, number three, I'm gonna have to say the dad on boys in the hood, man. As, oh, as much, Lawrence Fishburne. Yes, man, Lawrence Fishburne. As much as yeah, he was. He was sounding all preachy to him and all that, man, he was spitting facts to him. And, and I think he was trying to see them on a, on a good path. So I'll put him at number three, just because that's a, a dope movie to me. Number four, what's his name? Uh, off of like Mike. Morris Chestnut. <laughs> you know, he, he would be a dope father. You know, it always, it always gets me at the end. When when he adopts those two, oh, that's, shit. that's that's definitely one of. Them. <laughs> and then, I'm just hey, Morris Chestnut's not a name you're here, dog. That's that's wild. I like. Hey that. man, like that's that. that's one that just came to my head. I'm like, like Mike. That's that was another uh, another Father Time movie I like. Uh, and number five. All right, yo, this is gonna throw everybody off. So my son been watching this lately because he found it on Netflix. I think. But the dad off of Parent Trap, Dennis Quaid. Yo, that's yeah. a solid. So Dennis Quaid, yeah. if you think about him, he's like the '90s, 2000 dad. He was like the white like dad he's in, in the '90s. What movie is that? It's like a cheaper by the dozen knockoff. He Bro, in he's in all those in the family the rookie. Movie. Yeah, the rookie when he was a pitcher. Like that's a yeah, Dennis mm-hmm. Quaid's a good dad. 
Yep. Yeah, those those will have to be my dads thinking about it. And I was not prepared for that question. So I mean that's, that's pretty heart. good. Yeah, we, that's pretty good off the dome. Yeah, it's it's more like our calling card as as a podcast as a podcast, so something that we can lean our hat on. So we're glad that you, you know, off the off the hip, you were able to come off and and have like a really good list of names. Yeah, man. And and I mean, I've been I've been watching the episodes and seeing that, and I was like, all right, I got to get prepared for it, but I never really got prepared for that. So yeah, that's those, yeah. those are my five, man. I think so far Keith kind of won it when he put out the Michael Scott at the end of the office, just because. Like you said, because of what Michael Scott was trying to be as a dad, the as a man, the entire series, yeah. to see that he finally at the end became a dad, I was like, oh, that's good, good shit, good shit, Mike. I <laughs> thought yeah, he won it with uh, with Splinter because I wasn't oh, expecting bro. that. I th- Master Splinter, I was not expecting that. So in my eyes, like Master Splinter and Cleveland Brown are on that same list of like, oh damn, bro, like you got to really think about it because Cleveland yeah. is a stepdad. That's a straight yeah. up step, right? <laughs> and Master Spinner took these little boys on by himself. He was like, "I'm like, yeah. I, I guess I have you." We different species. I got, <laughs> I got you back. All right, so uh, just to go into like some of the basic questions that we do have for our podcast, um, this is one of the things that, as fathers, as content creators, you know, just started Birdie Vision Media, and you have things going on in life, your kids' life. You know, you guys, you know, separate times for things. So. Uh, kind of explain how you handle the guilt sometimes of saying no, uh, whether it be to um, startups or, you know, events that you already have commitments for or social events and like how you prioritize um, family time and then time for yourself. Bro, that's a good question. Saying no used to be the hardest thing for me to do, bro, especially when it was when I first started out Birdie Vision Media, just taking jobs and events and doing just different different things, trying to, you know, get out there. Saying no was so hard for me. And now I'm able to. Now I see why I need to say no to a lot of things. But, mm-hmm. man, I, I do feel a lot of guilt. And I feel it more when, when I tell my son no. And I really try not to tell him no to a lot of things just because, I want to give him that that life I never had. And I wasn't, not that I was told no to everything, but man, it was at at one point in time, it was me and my mom. So it was just, it was a small budget and a little apartment trying to make things shake. So yeah, man, saying no used to be the hardest, used to be the hardest thing for me. But but now it's, I I don't really feel guilty about it. When, when I have something, it's, it's life. You're, you're always going to be able to do something no matter what if you weren't able to do it before. Now, if it has, like, it, it's a life event, then that's something, obviously, that I prioritize and, and try to make uh, important in my life and, and make sure that nobody's contacting me when it comes to Birdie Vision Media or my business or Hack Dripless or anything like that. And it's go time with me and my son, so... I, I I really balance it out. It's hard. And I always tell my son, like, listen, dad's doing this. So eventually we could do this. And he's six now. He's kind of understanding. But I told him I'll never miss a sporting event. I'll, I'll never miss anything, any big milestones in his life, essentially, when it comes to academics, sports, whatever he wants to do in his life. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I'm there and, and saying no is, is going to be a big part of that. So that's, that's one thing that has made me really been able to say no is my son. So, and I, and I've, I've been saying no a lot now. (laughs) He be throwing that thing around now, huh? (laughs) Uh, Ty, I want to, to take a moment knowing when, this episode will air um, toward the end of February. Um, right now, Black History Month. We are three black fathers literally making black history by sitting here, chopping it up, talking about fatherhood. Um, I can say from personal experience, I knew that my dad never sat down and talked about being no. a dad with other dads. Unless he was 
bragging about me or saying this knucklehead over here like some Sanford and Son type shit. Um, I I'm surprised I didn't put Red Fox on my <laughs> list of, of of fictional fathers. By the way, mm-hmm. that, that guy's a goat. Um, but back to back to the question: us making Black History. Um, this is the first time that I really thought about it. I'm a girl dad. Blair's a girl dad. You have a son. Um, talk to us about the importance of raising a young black man um, and how you ensure that your kids know their history um, and traveling through this man, not predominantly black yeah. world. To think about the world that we live in today and raising our children in it, it's it blows my mind every day that like, I'm a father. Like I got, I got a little one to look after. I got a little one to teach, to to help grow into a man, and make sure he's the best man that he can be. So, I uh, I really teach him that that respect is is the most important, and and it's it's giving it, and you have to earn respect, and it's it's not going to be just handed to you. You're, you're going to have to carry yourself in a way once you do earn that respect that you kind of, when you enter a room, people feel your presence. And, and teaching him his, his history is, is different because he's a quarter black and that kid got the, the whitest, straightest hair in the world. And, <laughs> but, but I, I'll, I guarantee you, if you ask him, that boy is black. And, and he's proud of it. He is a, a proud black kid, and I, I make sure that he he knows that, and that regardless if we're mixed or not, like kind of like that uh, brand that you showed me. Yeah, I'm black. Man, I grew up with getting clowned by my black side and getting treated terrible by my white side. So it's it was a, a mix of two worlds, and I really teach him that no matter how those people look at you, you're black. I always say to the people that tell me, oh, oh, you're mixed, like you ain't fully black. Like, bro, what are the police looking at me like? Bro, I've had some experiences with police that, oh, it's a black suspect. They don't say white nothing. So I make sure that he he has respect to everybody, not, not just as a young black king, but he has respect to, to everybody, his elders, to everybody bleeds the, the same blood and that he really, when, when he is around people, he's going to, to treat people with kindness and, and love and support everybody. And I feel like I'm doing a decent job at it right now. Nah, fuck decent, bro. You're doing a great job, man. I appreciate it. Uh, to understand, to understand where yeah. we all come from, white, black, or indifferent. Bro, like, we all come from great circumstances or terrible circumstances, but when you become a father, we all hit the same plane. It's all the same fear. So to know that you have that fear and you're trying and you're actively there, it's like the post that I had earlier today, bro, like, your presence is the present. And, like, like somebody hit me up and was like, that's kind of arrogant to think about as a parent, don't you think? And I was like, no, because I didn't have a dad. So I don't know what that feels like. Penelope has an advantage. She is more privileged in a sense than other children because her father makes an active effort to be present every single day. My presence as a father, the the pure notion that dad, like she knows, oh, my mom can call daddy. My mom's boyfriend can call daddy. My stepmom can call daddy. And all four of these people are legit running a zone defense against me. And she she is locked in, and it's not like in a, a punishable way, but it's it's in a way where like she feels confident, she feels loved, she feels seen and heard. And at the end of the day, she knows true love and what relationships look like because again, her the presence of her dad is there, and that's ten times more than what anybody any other children in this neighborhood can say, or, you know, hell, kids our age, bro. So give yourself that grace to know that, like, you in your head, like, man, I might be trying, I I fuck up this time, but, like, not saying that you being there is enough, but you being there 
your son will remember those moments more than the moments that you spending money on him. Dead ass. That's real. Yeah. I, I always say that. I always say that to his aunt and uncle sometimes. It's like, I appreciate and he appreciates you buying stuff for him, but you being here is, is way more meaningful to him than anything. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I know he knows it too. And, and just, I mean, he wrote a note the other day. My, my grandfather had passed last week and he wrote a note about a memory it was just him sitting on his lap as a baby so it just like that type of stuff it it, it really shows me that we raising some good kids out here and, and it takes a village to, that you got a village to around yeah. so it takes a village to raise a kid it takes everybody's efforts from grandmas stepmoms stepdads all that and so I, I respect everybody that's co-parenting and doing it together because my dad wasn't in my life until I was 16 years old. He had hit me on, on MySpace at the time. So it was like not having a, a pop. Damn. Yeah, bro. And, and I, had, I had a stepdad, so, and, and he was a white man. So it was different. It was I, I knew he wasn't my real father. I knew that my dad was out there somewhere. But, yeah, man, he, yeah, he had hit me on MySpace and not having his presence for 16 years because that's 16 that's the age you think you can you can try everybody at it yeah for oh, sure your shit don't sing at that point exactly so yeah man yeah having him come in my life late is I, I feel you bro i i do everything to make sure that my son never feels empty like i did but so you kind of touched on it and uh we we wanted to uh send our condolences to you and your family to you as family Thank you. um with your with the passing of your great grand or with your grandfather passing, sorry. Um we we both had a conversation off air um for days. <laughs> uh myself and D'Amico kind of back and forth about yeah. if we even wanted to bring this subject up. <clears throat> um but knowing that it's something that A, a lot of men don't talk about in general, B, uh something that is needed for you to to grieve and, and with your brothers to, to get it off your chest Absolutely. um and also for your son to be able to when it drops when it when this airs and also in the future be able to see uh your answer to this question we wanted to kind of give you the grace and the time to grieve openly with your brothers express how you have had to handle grieving the the loss of your grandfather alone with your family, but also as a father with your young man, like explaining to him the stages of grief and showing him how you are either open about it or not open about it. Like kind of touch on it. If if you're okay with Absolutely. it, you can touch on it. Absolutely. No, man, this is this is definitely the time for it. I know I appreciate both of y'all. I know y'all have gave me the the option to to put this off but no i think I, I needed this and and to answer that question or those questions man it was it was extremely hard man that man so he wasn't my grandfather by blood i'm i'm actually adopted by my i call him dad troy and that was his family but they've been around since i was eight, seven, eight years old, even before that, when they were just dating. And, but his dad, Norm, my grandfather, he treated me like I was one of his grandkids from the moment I met him and I could remember being little and just everything that he did. He, he really accepted me and, and he was from a small town and in Nebraska, I mean, at that Ooh. having having a a black kid come into your family as a as an all white family, I'm sure it's different. And I don't know how they felt, but I know that that man treated me with just, with the most love and and respect that he did all of my cousins. And really, with with his passing, so I had to be a pallbearer, and that was the first time I've lost a lot of people in the past like two years and. This one, this one hit different. And I think it was because the past 
four or five years, I wasn't able to really go down to see him that much. I wasn't able to spend a lot of time with him. I wasn't able to talk to him a lot as much as I did in the past. So it really hurt different than I'm sure most because I felt guilt about it. And then trying to be there, be strong for my son and, and not break down in front of him and make sure that he understands what's going on along the way and why it's an open casket, why it's this and why we're doing this and why dad has to carry the casket and things like that. It, it was hard to explain to him. But at the end of the day, knowing what he did and what he was doing that entire time and how he was kind of handling things, according to my mom and, and his aunt, my sister and things like that. I, I really think he understood what dad was going through and, and what what everything that was happening in that moment was going to be okay and dad's still going to be there and, and this is like there was a time on the way down there that I just I kind of did broke down and I started crying and I was didn't know what to do in the moment and he just patted me on the back and like it's gonna be okay dad and I knew I knew at that time for a six-year-old to say that it, it kind of blew my mind I was just like you're right it's it's gonna be okay like this man was 84 years old or gonna be 84 this year he he lived a a long like like my cousin said in the eulogy uh, a statue worthy life and, and he now seeing and everything and him being gone when we would go over there where's grandpa at? You know, he's at the lumber yard working now i know why he worked so hard and that was to see his family happy and to to see his kids and their kids be great and and be what and and every last one of them are and and I respect every last one. Even 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 when I gave my stuff that hell and I put him through the most, man, that man was instilling what he learned from his father into me, and and now I understand. Yeah. That. So I want to do that same thing to my son and and make sure he knows that, hey, even though dad's gone, sometimes he's just working. He's he's trying to give you that better life and make sure you're happy. So. Nah, man, it, it is, it's, that was, that was really good to really get that off my chest, man. That man meant a lot to a lot of people. And there was well over 200 plus people at that funeral. So it Damn. was good to see the love that, that he deserved. I mean, even when he was here, he, he had that love. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing time. I was able to really teach my son. The, the way of life and how life is and and how even though he's gone now he was one of the happiest men in the world like just seeing his family yeah. together just seeing just being able to go do stuff and that man was active up until the day he passed like YMCA working out every day playing cards with his home like three four times a week like that man was active so yeah man it it was it was hard it's, it's hard not to, to break down now and really just thinking about all the good times that we had. But, man, that that man would be proud as hell of me. I, I know it. And he would be he would he would be like, why the hell are you crying? Why are you scheduling that podcast? You better go do that shit. So it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely in, in his honor that that I, I give him that that great. So. Yeah, Norm, he was a good man. He was a hell of a golfer, too. So I, I hope uh, he's up there playing with the greats right now. Oh, yeah, for sure. This episode is definitely dedicated to Norm. Heard he had a hole-in-one back in 06. Man. You know what I'm saying? So with the, with the swoosh ball, with the he had the Nike the joint. Ball. Come on, Norm. So, yeah, the shout swoosh. out to Norm for uh, watching over your family. I know that you – I don't know you personally, uh, but I know Ty – uh, and I know the the effect that you had on him. So I know you're up there playing, like he said, playing with some of the greats. So while you were talking, it kind of like reminded me of like, again, like D'Amico, what we kind of talked about. Like D'Amico was like, I, 
He's like, if if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to, because like I don't have that yet. I don't I don't have one of those. And I lost my so my stepdad Dion had uh, his mom passed away from cancer. I think like two years after he and my mom had met, like right before they got married. And um and then we lost Moses Heron, who was like our grandfather, um, I think like a year after. So it was weird because as a kid, I didn't under I didn't understand grief. I just knew that they're no longer here. I think I was like eight or nine. I just knew they weren't here anymore. Uh, but hearing stories about how my father or uh, 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 how Dion, my stepdad, um, how he dealt with it and what he went through, um, and then remembering stories that you know my granddad Moses was telling me. Uh, like right before he passed away, like it's like he kind of knew it. He kind of felt it and saw it coming. So um, he's looking at you and he's going to model how he deals with grief based off of how you deal with it. So um, I want to tell Dion on camera, because I know you you probably watch this when it comes out, Pops, like the way that you dealt with grief helped me deal with it because I have no problem crying. I have no problem expressing my love to friends uh because i have lost so many growing up you never know when the last time you see one of them don't cry because you lost it be happy because like you were here so the memories that you got be happy about and i want you to like just pass those memories on to your kid every story that you got a norm let them know uh, that's, uh and we all should do that we all should sorry that shit just broke me for a second i i do need to like pause for a quick one though bro no, nah, that's uh that's that's real. That's that's real right there. I honestly it kind of just hit me right now. Um cuz when I saw the news um that um that your grand grandfather had passed away, I reached out to Blair. I was like, "Hey, should we should we ask Ty about this?" <clears throat> and I was like, "In my in that moment of just, Hey, should we talk to Ty about this? I was like, yeah, I, I've never, I, I haven't gone through that. Like I, and I literally was just reminded about it literally just right now. I'm like, Oh shit. On my dad's side, both of my grandparents passed away. Like I, I, my, my grandpa passed away back in right. 2006. So it's been some time. My granny, she passed away 2021. So not that long ago, but it was just like you said, like there was that guilt. I hadn't seen her in a while. I was living my life trying to figure things out or whatever. Um, but when you, the story that you were, not the story, but what you were saying that happened when you were the pallbearer yeah. for, for, for your grandpa, that hit me because I was the pallbearer for my grandpa and I was what, 18 years old. It like, it didn't hit me until you feel the weight of a person, like the weight of a person. It, it just, it broke me in that moment. And I was just nervous. Cause I'm like, I've never done that before. I'm like, I better not drop this. I'm gripping so hard. I'm like, I am not going to be the one. It's not going to be me. <laughs> But like it was because it's such a real moment. Like you don't want it. I'm like my my arm, my hands are getting sweaty, my arm is getting tired. But I'm like, don't, don't drop you this thing. Don't you, do don't you drop <laughs> this thing. And my sense of humor. I'm talking a sense of humor. They might be uh, some church going folks, but they have a sense of humor, and that's what all of all the the grandchildren, the grandsons, mm. essentially. And there's like 13, 14 of us. And we were just all meeting before and just cracking jokes like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a heavy one. He was a big man, but. <laughs> and then they run, and I'm like, oh, bro, like, I got these big old shoes on that I'm never really in. What if I trip and fall <laughs> in front of. Everybody? Oh, man, you're taking everybody. Everybody down. I'm mm. taking everybody down. So, yeah, bro, it was the same thing. Mm. I was gripping for my life trying to hold on. Just... Yeah, you you looking at seeing who's on the other side, making sure y'all the same height, so y'all ain't lopsided. Like it's it's a whole coordination that's required. Um, but you mentioned an, an, another thing that I want to touch on. Um, 
you, you talked about your son patting you on the back yeah. and being like, it's all right. One, that's very perceptive of him. But I was it, that just reminds me of how much our kids pick up on what we what yeah. we're feeling and what we're doing in the moment and how much they're paying attention to what we do. Um, and like Blair said, like your son is looking to you as yeah. an example and you're setting a great example in this moment of while you're dealing in, in processing these emotions, but in everything that you, you do. Um, so, I mean, we can't say it enough. We're proud of you. I'm so, I am so thankful to have you in my life and you are just, I mean, Vice versa, I appreciate I'm very, you very blessed to have you. Y'all, y'all know that we, bro- we, we, you know, we brothers from, from more, more than one thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You already know. And, and yeah, man, nah, y'all have been there since day one for real. And Chris included like back in, yeah. I met Chris back in 2020, like 2019, I think it was like the end of 2019, I think. And yeah, man, it was, we just clicked and the same with y'all. Like it was just the first conversation. I'm like, I can just feel the, the genuineness, the, the realness coming from the both mm-hmm. of you and, and yeah. the way y'all support without asking for anything and the way y'all, y'all just are willing to do and check up on me and things like that. That's why I'm, I'm willing to call y'all my brothers. And, and I love that I'm able to call y'all my brothers. And I know that if I ever needed to call y'all, I can call y'all and y'all pick up and, and be able to just sit there and listen to me ramble on for hours. So now I appreciate the both oh, yeah. and having y'all in a light and yeah. the pleasure. Sure. So. For shit show, brother, it wouldn't be no other way. You got something to drink in your hand? You got something to drink in your hand? Audience, if you got something to drink in your hand, at this moment, we're going to take a quick a quick 10-second moment of silence for the man, Norm. Appreciate you. To Norm. I got goosebumps yeah. over here, man. man. We are like, like, I, like, honestly, dog, that we really real. did, like, he didn't bring it up. He kind of touched on it when when he first called me and like brought it up and he was like, "Yo, do you think that we should still?" I was like, first of all, we need to cancel it. Like, we need to either cancel it or reschedule it." And he was like, "Do we need to talk about it?" I was like, "No." Yeah. Like I was, and I I saw I saw it in his face. He was like, "Bro, like that was a very dismissive no." Because I was like, "No, like no, we don't need to talk about it." I don't want to, because in my eyes, I was like, we just started the podcast. People are popping on it. I'm not saying that we don't need to have this conversation, but maybe we need to postpone his conversation or his pod for another episode so we can then, like, we can keep the momentum of good vibes going. And then I talk to my mentor, talk to my brothers about it, talk to my mom about it. Um, the people that I call, like, low-key my counsel, some of the homies out here, y'all know who y'all are, the council. Uh, and they were like, why not? That is a real thing that's happened. One day you're gonna to have to talk to your shorty about grief. You got to, to explain to your shorty about uh <laughs> shit. Shit happening. <laughs> Cause I don't even want to say the words or even the thought. But I'm gonna to have to talk to my kid about that shit one day on both sides. Yeah. You dig what I'm saying? So no, nah, bro, like we needed to talk about this and it wasn't not saying that it wasn't for you, Ty, but that wasn't for you. What you just did was showing your son and every other father and every other child out there. Life is as tangible and as real as this, as this, and is as fleeting as air. Love the people and support the people that are here. The people that matter, matter. And the people that don't, don't. Don't care about the people that don't. I don't care about the people who don't matter. The support that we have for each other, the love that we have for each other, the support that we have for this community, we have it, bro. That's it. Um, we are going to pivot here. Um, I want to ask you as the drip master. Oh, okay. We, we we asked other folks what their top five is. This is our not top five. We given it you the first one. Obviously, I want your not top five drip misses of your life so i'm gonna give you the example i gave blair there was a time and a place where where D'Amico was rocking a puka shell necklace that ain't it that is a miss that is not it. that is a miss what i would also consider a miss that early 2000s soldier boy 
t-shirt dress thing that was never that was never my the, thing i might piss some people off on that but like i was never the four that. eggs white tea that was me baby <laughs> ooh, ooh, ah. I that up every friday i got paid <laughs> Yeah, the it was, like, it was like five for twenty or something like that. I was getting them, man. Yes, sir. Yes, years. sir. He knows. I told them puka shell necklaces. That's about to be number okay, one for sure. Let's go for it. <laughs> there was a time that I rocked Jinko jeans. If y'all don't know what Jinko jeans are, go Google that stuff. Bro. I don't know what I was going through and why I wore those. But it was Jinko jeans and a FUBU shirt, bro. Jersey. FUBU jersey. That was a fit to me. Number one miss. For you by us? Bro, number one miss. Hands down. Big miss. It was terrible. My my second miss ever? Man. When I first started golfing, I thought I had to be the most tour fucking dude in the world. Shout out to my Callaway family. I love y'all to death. But this color of blue Callaway shirt that I had with some navy blue pants and some white Brooks Kepka Nikes was the most Nikes, okay. I have ever worn on the golf course. It was bad. I don't know who I was trying to be. I don't know what I was going through. I thought I had to look the the part when I went to every golf club. And that was yeah, it was terrible. But shout out to Callaway. They got some dope stuff now. Um, <laughs> number three. I lo- love the subtle, subtle plug. I love yeah, it. Yeah, shout out to Callaway. Number- we go- we- <laughs> shout out Callaway. We're going to need you too. Remember when Cameron came out with pink tea? When it was it was all the teas. It was black tea, pink tea, blue tea, red tea. Yes, yes. Remember Cameron's pink tea? I thought I was Cameron. Oh no, you you weren't alone. Bro, I was rocking pink to everything. I'm talking I I purposely washed a red shirt with my white teeth to turn the <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was rocking a uh, not pink fur thinking I was camera. Bro, legit. And, and that was flip phone era too, so I had a pink flip phone. Legit, bro. I had the Joel Santana bandana. I had that motherfucker on and threw that bitch to the side. Number four. I want to say number four is recent because I recently got into Zest. I don't know why, but I just like it. Maybe it's it's a dad vibe for me. But I got this Zest and I got it from Target. I'm a big Target and Walmart shopper when it comes to just small accessories like vests and things like that. I got this brown hoodie, and I put this, bro, I see this vest right now. Hold on, man. Yo, love it. <laughs> All right, Bye. so back to number four. All right, so what, what, what did, what's, this, uh, what's this Target vest look like, huh? Bro, so I had a brown hoodie under this fake Burberry. <laughs> it has... Bro, it, you know, go yard. It has come, come, fake bring, bring them more this way. Bring them more to the, to the. Yeah, there you go. Bro, it has fake <laughs> yard print. It has a red stripes on it. It's Not it's th- brown and tan. It has corduroy around the neck. Not the go berry. Bro, Not the go berry. <laughs> I, put, I put this hat on and was looking like a damn UPS man. Oh my god! <laughs> what can Brown do for you, looking ass nigga? <laughs> I was sorry. I thought I was fit. I had I had these fire ass Timberland hiking boots. I was great. Cause I was like, send, yeah, me the, really bad now here. send me the pick. Send me the pick because I know you got it. Yeah, send it, send it <laughs> to the group. You send it to the group chat. Yo, he probably had a a, a, a MySpace looking profile pic. Bro, what's funny? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't shit. <laughs> <laughs> I you sitting like this right here. <laughs> you know all them but, bathroom photos like prob- selfies. Oh my god, bro. Yeah, but yeah, man, this was this was hideous. And it was like a mirror picture type vibe too, so it was yeah, like heavy MySpace two thousand eight vibe. 
I probably would have been okay with that. If I saw you, I would have been like, that's a, that's a vibe. Because I'm, I'm a big vest person. I, lo- I love vests. See, yeah, I was about to say, that's like your thing, though, probably. You probably like the vest. That's not a miss for you, D'Amico. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm over here taking notes. Like, I'm about to go to Target that, and get that oh, vest. That vest looks good. The go berry? <laughs> Give me the go berry, please. I'll take one. That's At first, I'm like, yo, this is fire. I, I like this. I wore it out. I got a few compliments. I'm like, yeah. I looked in the mirror, and I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> take that shit off. Take it off, gang. I'll wear it to I'll wear it to work where no one knows what drip is, and it, I'll be the most fire dressed. Hey, D'Amico, you you're looking a little <laughs> a little snaggy out there, brother. Yeah. <laughs> what is that phrase the young guys say? Drippy. They still use swag in this bank. I'm like, no, stop. I, I get out of that bank, yeah. bro. They're gonna take away your youth, <laughs> bro. When I, I still see people in the golf industry saying swag, but let me let me stay on track. Number five, at one point in time when I was a kid, I remember this too. I don't know if it was because of school or something we were doing. I thought I was a cowboy, like flannel. My mom had these cowboy boots that she had wore for some probably Halloween outfit, bro. I was rocking them, cowboy boots too big, some like straw cowboy hat. Bro, I thought I was straight cowboy. Yeah, it was yeah. Bad. <laughs> yeah, I had the cowboy it hat was... on the other day, bro. I felt I felt good though. No, I, like now I could I could definitely rock it. That fit though was like just pulled up out of a <laughs> trailer out of, outside of San Antonio, Texas, and was looking bad. It he said, "No, nah, that wasn't it, guy." <laughs> Oh, boots boots were, I don't know what size my mom wore, but like eight sizes too big for me. It was bad. Mm-hmm. Now, I got I to gotta ask, because this was never a, a fit that I would wear ever. But what was your stance on the double pop polo collar? That's a miss, right? Bro, to be honest, <laughs> 2000. 2000- oh, no. Was it was it 2005? Was it my freshman year or sophomore? I think it was my freshman year, bro. It was the plaid shorts, and they were white, black, and orange. This was the first of the day school fit. I thought I was so. They were black, white, and orange, like plaid joints. And then it was a black polo and an orange polo underneath, so it matched just perfect. And yeah. I think I had some black and orange shoes on too, bro. I don't know what I was thinking some of these days. So I'm not gonna lie to you. I think that was just the, I did the, the early 2000s. Thing. I did the double pop collar. That was me, bro. I, love that, it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why I ever I thought, decided I thought of the shit. Kanye, bro. and I was everything. Yeah, I was. I was gonna say Kanye. Kanye, had Kanye. folks acting crazy. Kanye had me out here legit. Like Kanye and Lupe Fiasco legit had me begging my parents for go yard bags. We broke bro, I think shit. I, I don't need no goddamn go yard bag. Oh my god, go yard bag, please. <laughs> Can I please have babe sneakers? I love you. I want extra Christmas gifts. <laughs> nigga, babe Bro. shoes. She's like nigga, babe shoes. You want a nigga just get a Nike swoosh and throw a star sticker on that bitch. What the fuck are you talking about, babe shoes? I asked for babes and I got Air Force One. Yeah, she was like, we can go to. She said, you can either get the babes you want and never get shoes again, or you can go over to the finish line and get that two for ninety. I messed up my Air Force One, and my mom got me stacked. Bro, I remember vividly going to Payless getting the shoes one year. Bro, going to seven move one year, okay? Shaq's, dog. From Air Force One to Shaq's, your mom legit was teaching you a lesson. Bro. <laughs> that was a lesson learned, nigga. <laughs> Respect the shit you get the first time. Let, let me ask you a quick question because I'm, 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 I'm curious because I'm obviously shopping for myself. What is your your go to like your everyday kick around shoe? New Balance. Because right, right now I'm New Balance. New Balance five fifty. They're comfortable. Okay. They're better than Air Forces. Sorry, Nike. Um, New Fuck Balance. Nike, they don't pay us. <laughs> New Balance five fifty. They need to make that a golf shoe. That would be the. I would. I would walk an eighteen. I do not walk eighteens. I got a bad back, bad knees, but I would walk an eighteen in those. I do everything in them. I 
I love them for when I'm doing video work because they just feel good. They got arch support. I got fat, 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 flat feet. So, yeah, man. New Balance. <laughs> really anything New Balance, to be honest. But 550s are my go-to. Since starting your Instagram journey in general, you kind of started with your uh, like fit checks or drip checks uh, as you started like that series and then transitioned over to, uh, like we talked about getting behind the camera. How do you make time for birdie vision uh, when you're not being a dad and how do you maintain uh, that sense of fulfillment uh, so you can better be, a, 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 so you can be a better father and a better husband? Man, as of last August, I think it was August 25th. Uh, that was my last day in the corporate world. So really trying to work around all of that and having a son, a nine to five, uh, it was difficult. Like it mm -hmm. was being up from, I put him to bed at 9.30 and I would be up until two, three o'clock in the morning, sometimes not sleep and just kind of sleep if he goes to school or daycare. But it was, yeah, man, it was tough. And, but now I'm doing it full time and now it's a full time gig for me. And being, him being at school is, that's when I know that's my work time. Like it's, let's get shit done. Let's do what we have to. And when he's out of school, it's, it's his time. It's whatever he wants to do. Now, when he's playing VR and doesn't want anything to do with that, then yeah, I'm, I'll, <laughs> and I'll be able to work when I can so nah yeah, yeah it, it was it's definitely hard and and I get that guilt feeling a lot but I know that the sacrifices I'm making he's going to understand one day that it was for the better good so do you so do you like map out like schedule wise with you and your partner because I know like are you are you married or no not yet nope nope not married not married okay. uh, yeah me and my son's mom it's a it's a complicated situation, but we aren't gonna we, talk about it. We no. just want to know about the mapping out situation. <laughs> Sorry, we uh, no, bro. I have it's called Motion. Um, no, this ain't an ad, but the Motion app. It is, bro. I saw it on an Instagram ad. I tried it out for a week. I deleted it. I was like, I ain't doing this. This is ridiculous. I thought you this does this by itself. But no, I, then I went back to it realizing like, no, I, I have to map out my day like hour by hour and almost really like in 15 minute intervals at, at this point in time because uh, it's meeting after meeting. So, yeah, man, in the morning time, I, I really have my, my schedule down. I'm usually up by seven o'clock checking emails, doing what I need to, replying, responding, and then I, I really map out my day from that point on, like, okay, I know I have 15 minutes to do this. I have 15 minutes to go get a quick workout in or push up, whatever. I have 15 minutes. So it's really 15 minute intervals and, and it's all mapped around my son because it's, it's his world to me. Like I know it's not, but in, in all aspects of, of working and hustling, it's, it's his world. So it's around the time that he wants to spend with me and that he has stuff going on i'm going to make sure that my business is is wrapped around that and nothing is i don't care what it is nothing will come in front of my son if my son tells me that he wants to have a day to just sit and chill and me not go out and shoot whatever then that's what it's going to be if he wants to come with me then i'm telling him that we have a an extra worker today but yeah, man, it's it's his world. That's what I'm mapping around. For sure. Um, <clears throat> kind of touch on your transition from um, wanting to, I guess, like be in front of the camera and create the content Instagram wise to what made you want to get behind the camera about Birdie, Birdie uh, uh, excuse me why you wanted to get behind the camera and be the narrative teller for other people. Man, 
it's always actually something that I've really kind of had the passion for. And while I was doing my thing with Hack Dripless and even before that, Hack Life Golf, um, I really always kind of had a knack for I just need one person that is going to let me shoot and let me Mm -hmm. create for them. Like, I don't want to necessarily be this, but then shout out to Chris, Teal Kick Golf. He really kind of pushed me to go for it because coming into it, I didn't know what I wanted to do, man. I wanted to be a YouTube golfer. I wanted to review stuff. I wanted to do everything that I was seeing. I mean, this is 2019. Like, yep. really, the culture didn't load until after 2020, like 2021. Shout out to the when, yeah, it really started taking off for the culture in golf. So, mm-hmm. It was it was really Chris not knowing what to do and him kind of pushing me like, bro, you got style. You know, I, I had a little clothing line and I was like, dang, this this isn't really what I want to do either. Like, let me push other people's stuff. So then it was, then someone actually trademarked Hack Life Golf and I had to rebrand myself. So that was really what started me to, like, all right, we're going to do this drip thing. But then kind of as the culture grew the past two years, I'm like, dang, this isn't really what I want to do either. Like, I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't want to, I don't want to be the the influencer essentially that, and, and shout out to all the influencers and all my homies that are influencers. And, I mean, we, we all got homies, what mutual homies that are influencers and doing yeah. their damn thing. But for me, I can't do that consistently, bro. I can't put on that that face consistently. I'm a director, like I'm a a, a a genuine alpha male leader type of guy that I like directing, I like creating, and I I think that it really pushed me to go get the camera and and really it's it's art to me, man. It's it's being able to produce things for people and see their reaction to it and watch their facial expressions when they watch different things that I'm, I'm doing. I, I feel like that is something that really pushed me to be like, I really had something behind the camera. And then I, bro, I started writing a movie in like 2021 and D'Amico might know about it, but it was, it was essentially Happy Gilmore too. It was it was the the return of Chubb, and bro, I had I mean I I had an all star cast of every golf influencer ever, and I think that's what really back then I was like, all right, I I know I can do I, I'm good at writing. I I loved English growing up, but this hack drip list, this reviewing clothes. There's a new clothing reviewer every single day that pops up and. I, not that I didn't want to compete with them because I felt like I had my own lane with things and I'm a very blunt person. So it was, it was more of, I don't want this to become oversaturated. I, I like the, the people who are standing out right now, like golf project, shout out to my dog. Um, those types of people that are, are doing their, their thing with it, but I didn't want to keep oversaturating the market with things. So when I picked up the camera, I'm like, all right, who can I reach out to and and do some video work for? It? And that's, I mean, really it was golf that, that got me loving the camera again and being behind the camera instead of in front of it. Like, I just want to capture the, the dopest moments of our culture and our community on the golf course. And, Hell yeah. and that's, what, that's what really Hell pushed yeah. me to, to go start a full-blown media company and and we specialize in, in golf courses and real estate so and and not selling houses but but capturing those stunning views that us buyers want to see when we're when we're shopping so that's that's what really pushed me and then yeah it kind of expanded from there but I, I didn't really expect for it to be like this so quick and be able to yeah, create yeah. on an ink and and have a full blown running business, but now it happened, and and I'm grateful for it, and and I'm gonna keep working my ass off until, you know, God tells me time's up. But yeah, man, it's 
it was it was a a transition that was well worth it and well worth my sanity. It was bro, I was going through some weird depression stuff when I was in front of the camera and not getting the response mm-hmm. I wanted and and I want I want to make mm-hmm. sure that anybody that's trying to be an influencer that even if you're not getting the the response that you think that you deserve or that you feel that you should have, man, if you're getting one view or uh 13 comments, then man, at least someone is watching. There's someone out there that's going to see it and is going to love it. Like I know if I would have stayed consistent and kept going, I'm sure I could have had some some good brand deals. But in the end, that's not what I want for myself. The game, essentially, or me leaving my mark on the game. We'll put it like that. But, and I kind of think that's where we are with it as well. Um, when we sat down and kind of first started talking about this, the Miko and I, um, it was it was about blending what he was already doing with Vibe Golf and what I was doing with Honor Club Media and just like blending those two things together. With Honor Club Media, I just want to be a storyteller. I want to be able to highlight everybody's story. Like <clears throat> I'm not the most famous human being in the world by any stretch of the word, but I think that we all as creators, as black people, as men, we deserve that space and time to feel celebrated. Um, and then with what D'Amico is doing with Vibe Golf with being up to date, staying into the know or like creating content that was more, I was more long-term. He was short, uh, uh, short, uh, or excuse me, I was long form content with my podcast. D'Amico was short form with his, uh, with his Instagram reels and his vibe, like his vibe check-in. So we just blended those two things together. And when, when we came together to create father time, it was like, how can we come together to highlight fathers in a way to where other dads, at every stage of this is going to want to want to listen. And we talked about it before you hopped on. It was like, bro, we, the first, the first two episodes we dropped, we, we sat down and we came up with that process. D'Amico came up with that process on purpose. Like tell them like, kind of like tell them like how you and why the rollout is the way that you want it to be D'Amico. Yeah. I just knew one that we, we were still trying to figure out our, our chemistry on camera. Like I'm it's same with, 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 with you, Tom, like I've never met Blair in person. So like we just chop it up talking through DMS or whatever. I'm like, all right, well, do we have chemistry? So I'm like, all right, let's record an episode and it'll just be us talking about fatherhood and talking about our, our experiences and what started at, Hey, we'll just record 30 minutes turned into, we've been talking for an hour and a half. Should we stop? I'm like, no, we'll just cut this into two episodes. Let's just, let's just keep it going. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy that you're talking about like the, the mental aspect or the mental health aspect of posting on social media and not getting the response that you're hoping, like you put hours into drafting this piece of content and then it just kind of, Fizzles (laughs) Fizzles <laughs> doesn't hit the way that you want it to. Mm-hmm. And I saw a post that kind of made me recalibrate how I look at that. Like, oh, I only have 50 views on this video. You're telling me that 50 people, if 50 people came into this room to watch me do this episode, I'd be hyped. 50 people around me? Imagine 50 like, just, people in your room right now, dude. Bro, no, I, get off me. Huh? Give me some space. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell did you get here? <laughs> Be quiet. Baby girl is sleeping. <laughs> I'll learn about, about this guy. Got I'm it. back. Go I'm back. He's mad Let's at me. Go. I don't have no fruit snacks for him. But uh, <sighs> Who the fuck are you, dad? Get out of here with the no fruit snacks. Yeah, he already brushed his teeth, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we've talked about um, Birdie Vision Media. Um, we talked about um, all the the hack life stuff. Those are clearly passions of yours. Um, let's dive into your hobbies. So what are, what are some of your hobbies away from, we know that you play golf, obviously, but away from the passion of creating content and being a director, what are some of your hobbies that you do to just 
decompress, unplug, and uh, do you share any of those hobbies with with your son? Bro, yeah, actually, and it's what's funny is it doesn't even step away from the creative aspect of things or life. Period, bro. I draw like crazy. Like I, I'm into art. I've drawn pretty much all my life. I've been a decent artist, according to my family and my yes men around me. Uh, nah, man, I, I draw. And what's crazy is my son loves to do the same thing. Like he just got an art set for Christmas, a whole easel paint set, and he loves doing it. So sitting there, either coloring with him or working on our own projects together. And that's, that's really a hobby of mine that I think I enjoy the most is, is sitting there just drawing peaceful we'll have some music in the background whether it's that new stuff he listens to on youtube or it's some old school stuff i throw on for him but yeah man sitting there and and drawing is is definitely our piece i feel like we we just vibe and and chill laugh and have a great time doing it so yeah that's that's my big what do you what are you drawing now Bro, right now he's into Pokemon. So we've been going crazy Pokemon. The past couple years, it's been like all the Mario characters and Super Mario, Nintendo period. But yeah, like I'm a big cartoon guy. Uh, really, really anything I can, I just look at it and I can, I can draw it and. I don't get, I'm not something crazy that can create something out of nothing. I create something out of something. So it's like, take a look at something and I create my masterpiece around that. But yeah, man. And what's crazy is I got on on my iPad, I got Procreate, I think it's called. And I have, I think, over 200 different drawings, whether they're started, finished. But yeah, man, it's just drawing is so peaceful and cartoons is fun as hell to draw all right so because we've we've all probably had this conversation in the dms separately uh i know you and i have tied about uh about this conversation um it is big news to the golf community that Tiger Woods is no longer with Nike, that he has collaborated with, look at the face on him. He has collaborated with TaylorMade to create his own brand, Sunday Red. Ty has a lot of facial reactions right now. So I want to get Ty's full understanding of, or excuse me, full debrief of what he feels about Tiger Woods, Sunday Red. All right. I'm probably. <laughs> Such an exit. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Yo, shout out to Sunday Blue. Uh, it's Tiger. It's going to sell. It's appealing to an audience that obviously he captivates to a lot more when it comes to fashion. Stop, but, stop talking in coded language and say what you got to say, folks. Right. Sucks. That shit sucks. Stop talking in coded language. Say exactly what you just said, but don't code it. Say it how we talk about it in the DMs. Who did he make them clothes for? He made it for the the people that have been following him every step of the way on the tour, and I'm not one of them when it comes to his fashion. I admittedly do have a few tiger things because that's what I got when I first started golfing, but uh Nah, bro. This ain't it. Nah, dog. And I never, I didn't like Tiger shit when he was with Nike. Tiger legit gave motherfuckers a quarter neck turtleneck and a red polo and black pants, and like everybody's mock-neck. like, "Oh my god, that shit." Yeah, is the mock neck. Yeah, the mock neck. That's a, yo. The mock I got neck one. Is... I ain't gonna hold you. I got one, but the mock neck is it. ass, cause like that's the that's the brink mm. of his. That's like that's like the pinnacle of his golf fashion with Nike. Was instead of t- making it a turtleneck, okay. it was a mock neck. I yeah, I, I give you that. I'm not spending the extra forty dollars for that logo. And essentially, that's what that's what I'm gonna get at is we know bro ain't, ain't fashion. We know that he has 
never been in. Uh, I've never seen that man and been like, oh, damn, look what he got on. Nah. <laughs> bro, never. <laughs> ever. Bro. Ever. I'm, I'm for, for an athlete sponsored by Nike, he never wore hot Nikes. Ever. Crossover, so, my dude. You can do something. You can get Charles Barkley. You can get Jordans. You can get Ken Griffey's. You can do anything and put them on the course. He could have been the first dude doing all the things that Chris is doing right now, but he never did. I know for a fact. I know for a fact that he has somebody around him that looks at Instagram and sees the trends that are going on. I know for Mm -hmm. a fact that somebody next to him is on Chris's page. Bro, why don't you tap in with Chris, dog? Like, like these brands need to quit playing, dog. D'Amico, what do, you, what do you think needs to happen in order for it to be a shift in the fashion game? It's They're active about it. Um, that's one. The players need to be more active. I just saw the video of Zach Johnson going crazy at the waste management because someone made a comment about him of, 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 about the Ryder Cup. It's stupid. Yeah, exactly. um, the second thing, yeah, the, the second thing, they need to set aside a fund for the creators because I'm, I personally, I look towards people like Chris, people like yourself, uh, Ty, um, obviously shout out Roger, like any, like I moved with Roger. I had never wear, worn a pair of Adidas ever. When Roger went from Nike to Adidas, I'm like, I'll get a, I'll, I'll get a pair of Stan Smiths. They look cool now. It's it moves the needle. The the creators move the needle because that's what we see now. We see this this spike in YouTube golf. Um, that's what they they need more of that. Um, they need. I would just love to listen to Roger and. I mean, throw out any other creator, Eric Lottery, them commentating on a whole. They they trying to tap in, they trying to tap in with with Eric Lottery now. There's there's those players like Ricky. He trying to. There's you can see that they're trying to to build their social media, but they using us to do it. That ask the final question. Um, give you sixty seconds on the clock. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to any father before the stage that you're at? So any new dad or expecting dad, what's that one piece of advice that you would give um, to that new dad? Don't trip, man. Don't, don't stress about the small shit. Like you're new to this. This is something that you've never done before. It's, it's going to be a different world that you're in now. And you're not good or bad at it. You're you're going to get better as everybody around you grows and as your your baby grows. And and don't don't stress yourself out of over uh man, I'm I don't think I'm doing this right. I don't think I'm 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 I don't think I'm good at it because you are, you're present, you're there. You're good at it because you're there. You're you're trying. That's what makes you good at it. That's what makes you a good father, and that's what makes you a good person. Is is you're trying, and that's all your kid wants to see is you try. And as long as you're trying, and they're gonna be right there with you, and and no matter what, and what you do, when they're not looking, you're still their hero. At the end of the day, so whether you think you're doing bad or whether you think you're the greatest father in the world. That little kid looks at you as you're their hero, and and that's that's what that's what should bring you joy in life, and and that's what should settle you down when you should just think of that when you think times are getting tough. No matter how hard things are, that little kid's still looking at you as you're the greatest thing in the world, and that's what makes me, I guess, love being a father is, is okay. knowing that no matter the wrongs I do. I'm going to come home and my son's going to be happy that I'm his damn dad. That's it. <laughs> That's all it takes, bro. Like, legit, you just being there, bro. Like, my day's trash. My boss yelled at me. I fucked up the sale. That haircut was bad. I could have did this better. But you come home and it's like, hey, daddy, you trying to play? Yeah, let's oh. go for it, my nigga. Let's, it's up. That's the greatest feeling, bro. 
It's the greatest feeling. Best feeling in the world, and that's all that matters. That that's all that should matter to to you as a father is is once you once you end your day and you walk through them doors and and even shout out to the fathers that aren't able to see their kids because of certain reasons and things like that. As long as y'all are trying, don't give up. But once yeah, you walk through the time. door, once they see their dad, no matter how long it's been, that kid's gonna run up to you and, and everything is out that window. So Yep. So yeah, I'll go. That's, that's my advice, man. Just just be strong, be a father, be present and and don't ever think that you're doing anything wrong. I mean, unless, you know what I'm saying, you you wilding, but... Unless you're a trash-ass yeah. nigga, then don't be a trash-ass nigga. That's what we're saying. That's what you're trying to say, kind of. Exactly. All right, real quick, uh, before we get up out of here, um, we, we kind of, before we get up out of here, we kind of like to ask our guests this question. Uh, who should we try and lock in with? If you could, If you could put anybody's feet to the fire to have them on the episode next on the next you know season whatever it shall be who do you want to see on father time as a dad next i'm gonna give y'all two people the first one is my guy rory blackwood well three technically but y'all already said one so rory for sure y'all have to get on i will i'm gonna put it in his ear as soon as i get off of this i'm i'm going over bro you need to get on this but nice rory is is a great fucking father and i don't know if people pay attention to it or his stories but that man is a good father oh he's hell out he got his boys out there running routes i've seen him before it's fire bro I love I love his parenting style and just the little glimpses that we get and that he shares with us. And I, I genuinely appreciate it and it's inspiring to see. And that's what I want to do with my boys. So um, another one is my guy, Thomas Jackson, the owner of Part 365 Golf. Bro, a, another crazy thing is I ain't know that man from a can of paint. <coughs> Excuse me. I ain't know that man from a can of paint. And hit that dude up like, bro, let me shoot your grand opening. And I did it for free. Um, I'll forever love that dude because that dude gave me opportunities and introduced me to people. But that man is a dope father and a dope businessman. And he knows the balance of right now holding a corporate job, starting a, a whole facility and new business that people can actually come into and then being a father when he goes home at the end of the day. So. Yeah, those, and then and then my guy Jeremy. Y'all already said that dude's a, a, a an amazing yeah. father. And his shout story, to Jay. It. man. Yeah, shout out to my guys. I think those are the the three that you should definitely have on the podcast. Well, Thomas and uh, and Roy will be coming for you. Jeremy, will be, I, I think we we'll actually record your podcast next week. So. <laughs> So week, yeah. we already we got have them all next week. We got the uh we got the cricket beverage on deck too. You dig what I'm saying? So it's going down as soon as we get yeah. up on here. Bro, you guys like I think uh I think Thomas like Thomas and Par 360 got me wanting him to, you know, after a couple successful, you know, seasons over there in, in uh in Minnesota, I want him to come out here to Oregon and and try to open up one of those in, in Eugene because I, when I tell you there's dude, there is the market is just like Minnesota. There's not a space for we don't have an indoor golf space at all in Eugene. Like we legit have to drive two hours to Portland to get to Top Golf. Or you gotta <clears throat> get like a little small simulator screen to hit at a hotel, but it's only two screens. They kind of mess up every single time. So if we could get a place like Par 360 down here in Eugene. I swear, like that shit will go crazy. So, I can't wait to Bro, talk I, to Thomas because that's gonna be the first thing I tell him that. <laughs> Please come on out here. Let me let, let me let me tap in. I told Bro when I met him, I said, "Bro, we ain't gonna stop until you have twenty five locations, hands down." I love it. Um, all it takes when whether it's social media doing some consultant work for bro bringing people in i'm i'm trying to make it pop but yeah bro that would be lit because i mean yeah. not many people uh my, my dude matthew actually knows this is uh i got some p and dub in my blood so uh i know that 
I was yeah, I was out there for my. I mean, my pops is out in Seattle right now. Wave. Um, I I originally went to the high school in Vancouver, Washington, which is five minutes away from Portland. So I was running mm-hmm. the streets. That's where I kind of started my whole rapping career and everything. So, uh, Matt was actually at one of my shows, which is super crazy and super small world. Um, Did it down in down in Beaverton, bro? Yes, bro. That's crazy. crazy. When you talk to him, That's ask him crazy. about that, bro. This was like yeah, we will, we will. Eight years ago, bro, and yeah, he was. <laughs> we was. We had a house packed for New Year's Eve, but uh, yeah, bro. Uh, the the Pacific Northwest definitely holds a special spot in my heart, so I know that eventually one day. I will be up there doing some type of business, and and that's definitely something I would be down to do. Yeah, the PNW is definitely a it's a it's a place that uh, is ripe for the picking, bro. Like, there's so many opportunities for entertainment here. We already got the food spots, we already got the the lifestyle and the family growth areas. We just need the entertainment, especially with uh, with the uh, the University of Oregon moving onward to the big 10 we kind of like more of a midwest school now we gotta have more entertainment if we're gonna want to have those black kids stand out here because right now we already get them niggas leaving so uh but with that being said man um hold on let me get this fucking itch out my ear i'm gonna let you get that out you ready all right here we go all right y'all with that being said man uh we don't want to keep them for too long but we could be talking for hours with my brother ty um, but we want to make sure this this episode comes to a close on on a, on a positive note. We we appreciate you so much, Ty, for pulling up with us. Um, you you gave us some good gems. You've expressed a multitude of different layers of who you are. We we truly hope that everyone has the opportunity to from this point on get to know a bit more about you, and also follow along with your uh, with your journey over at Birdie Birdie Media Vision. Um, because it's it's a uh, or birdie birdie right I said it right right birdie vision, birdie vision, vision media. media there birdie vision media uh, because it's a uh, it truly is something that I I feel like I have attached my wagon to just because we brothers but uh, more or less I, I I agree with most of the content that you got coming out so we appreciate you for coming in um, we appreciate you guys for watching you could have been anywhere in the world but you decided to rock out with the podcast. I am your play party host and most your country cousin, Blair, a.k.a. Sir Winnie. That's my brother, D'Amico. That's our brother, Ty. Um, thank you for you being girl. here, man. Yeah, for sure, for it sure, always. Fun. Make sure that you guys leave a like, subscribe, comment, share with some people, um, and let us know what your f- top miss in fashion history is, because we would love to know. We'll support your homies. Support it, because it's free. <laughs>